Welcome to the Amphibian Press Podcast. I'm Sarah Boris, and with me today is A.D. Hopkins, author of The Boys Who Woke Up Early. So um, why don't you tell me a little bit about your debut novel? It's a coming-of-age novel set in uh, Western Virginia in 1960. And it's uh, people in the Appalachians uh, do seem to like the book a lot. It's about a uh, couple of guys named uh, Stoney and Jack. And Stoney is a uh, kind of a juvenile delinquent. And Jack is a uh, compulsive liar. Uh, but everybody likes him anyway because he's entertaining. <laughs> It's set in a town called Early in 1960 in the last of the Eisenhower years when Jim Crow and the color bar is still in effect and the Ku Klux Klan is still lurking around. Uh, these two boys with, their, with a fellow named Roosevelt, who's a black man who doesn't, uh, who doesn't conduct himself in a sufficiently servile way to satisfy the local rednecks, uh, the three of them between them helped drag the town into the 20th century, thus becoming the boys, the boys who woke up early. And uh, they do this while comically blundering toward adulthood in a dark comedy of uh, bad choices and, and blind luck. Well, I love... Um I mean, it's unfortunate that it's still relevant uh, today, um, but I love that you're sort of showcasing a lot of these things with um, this historic aspect. Um, and it's, I think we all blunder into adulthood. <laughs> I don't think there's any other way to do it. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your inspiration um, behind the novel. I think I just wanted to write an entertaining story about uh, uh, two young men who uh, uh, grew up in, in 1959 and 1960 in a small town in Virginia and the, and the adventures that it was possible for them to have. But uh, uh, it got into, I got very interested in the personality of these guys and uh, particularly in Jack, the compulsive liar. Uh, I, in my journalistic career, I learned that there are many people who uh, who want to have interesting lives, and they do it by, or uh, well, they want to be known for having interesting lives, and then some of them live it, and some of it, uh, some of them simply lie about it, but some of them do both. Jack is a guy who does both. Uh, those were those were the most interesting characters I met. But it was often difficult to sort out the fiction from the fact about those people. So uh, ended up writing a book in which one of those is one of the principal characters. I, I really am drawn to um, the unreliable narrator because of that. You sort of have to tease these facts from fiction, and even as a reader, you're sort of a detective in your own way um, when you're reading yeah. those types of characters. Yeah, and in fact, my narrator is, my first person narrator is reliable, but the person who's talking to him most of the time is not reliable. <laughs> so you get two sides of the coin there. Yes, yes. I'm also concerned with, I'm also concerned with people who, uh, who uh, have, Dark, who have a dark side to them as well as a good side to them. And I think most of my characters do. Um, uh, what happens in the story is Jack has this fantasy of becoming a private detective at the age of 16. He draws in Stoney and they start hanging around the sheriff's office and become involved with real lawmen and small town politics and racial strife. Some people ask me if, if this stuff really happened. I say, because I'm a journalist, I set the rule for myself that 
similar events had to have happened in real life to somebody somewhere in the region, but not all in one town and not all to the same group of people. Now, tell me a little bit about your, your background as an investigative reporter, because I, I always love when authors, you know, because most of us have, have day jobs, it's when authors draw from their, their life story for their work, because it does lend this depth to it, um, this richness that, you know, maybe wouldn't be there if we were just researching on our own from our computers. So tell, tell me a little bit about that. I mean, you've, you've already touched on it. Well, I broke into journalism in Lynchburg, Virginia, and I went from there to Petersburg, Virginia. And uh, those are just small cities in the midst of many rural counties. Mm -hmm. So as a cub reporter, I would cover the police beat in those small cities and all those small counties. And I met very interesting people in the police departments and the uh, and the courtrooms, and then even the jails of those small counties. Um, it was still a time when um, sheriff's deputies were not hired on the basis of their academic credentials or their police training, but on their uh, the their character as the, as the sheriff judges. Sometimes the basis. Of, simply their friendship mm -hmm. so out of those uh out of any small group of those deputies you would have one guy who was a natural leader mm -hmm. another who was a another who was simply a clown uh still another who was decidedly dim-witted but made up for it in loyalty and courage um you, same the same breakdown of personalities that you would normally find in a patrol of Boy Scouts or a squad of soldiers. Uh, and you found that, so they had not professionalized law enforcement yet, and so you had a lot of interesting characters there. And of course, the, the characters they deal with are also highly interesting. The, the people they arrest, the people they decide not to arrest because it wouldn't do any good. So what, um, I know a lot of people who um, you know, write crime or um, you know, historic thriller sort of genre, they have like a, a cold case or a, a, maybe a case that was solved that is their, their white whale, the case that they keep getting drawn back to and um, or that they keep drawing from for for their work do you have one from from your own work in this book the the boys get involved in trying to solve a burglary for a local politician and it's a small time crime some people have called this book the hardy boys meets the ku klux klan they do manage to solve the crime and but that that's only incidental to the uh, to the story in the book. Mm -hmm. The book becomes more about the boys growing up and the good influences of this that this chief deputy named really Big Ben Ag has on them, and uh, they're developing a friendship with Roosevelt and having to stand up against the racial uh, mores of the town they're in. Mm -hmm. Early, by the way, is a fictional place. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very much like the towns I worked in as a young reporter, but uh, I chose to make it a fictional place rather than a real one because some bad stuff happens in this story and it didn't really all happen in any one town, so I didn't want to give a black eye to any real town. Uh, I think what the book means is it shows what it was like being a white teenager in 1960 when the South was reluctantly, very reluctantly, changing its unfair ways of life. Mm -hmm. And it shows how friendships and first loves were affected and that even very biased people contribute to positive changes if they behave ethically. 
And some of the people who bring this about are very young. Well, I think that's, that's incredibly important and especially to show that it is sometimes, oftentimes, um, the youth that helps kind of spur a lot of this, um, a lot of these movements on. Because it, it is easy to sort of gloss over like, oh, these kids don't, don't know anything. And it's like, well, I mean, sometimes they don't, but sometimes they do. And um, I think we could stand to listen to to the younger folk sometimes. Well, my characters mostly don't know don't don't know what's the right thing to do, but they blunder into it. <laughs> my smartest character is a girl uh, named Mary Lou uh, Mary Mary Lou Martin. Uh, she's the m most. She, and I think that's true to life because when you're 16 years old, girls are more mature and more uh, more. Uh, uh, aware of the world as a general thing. And Mary Lou certainly is, certainly is more with it than the boys are. So do you have, um, you know, having been an investigative reporter, do you have a, a pet peeve um, that books or, or films, like a lot of the crime dramas on television now, that they consistently get wrong or they sort of gloss over? Well, I, I find it sometimes very good uh, crime dramas with very good scripts. Uh, there's a disconnect between the storyline and the and the uh, visuals. Um, I watched one the other night in which uh, the narrator, who was an ex-retired policeman, specifically said that a victim was shot with a double-barreled shotgun and uh, the visuals showed uh, the victim being shot with a pump shotgun. Uh, or sometimes they'll pick up cartridges expended from a uh, nine millimeter semi-automatic and it'll be quite obviously a revolver cartridge in the visuals. <laughs> They want something that, you know, the, the lay person can recognize, I suppose. Uh, well, the lay person would be able to, the, a nine millimeter semi-automatic cartridge is the most common cartridge there is. <laughs> and yet they've got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever's on set, just throw that in. It'll be fine. <laughs> no one will that's, what they're doing. that's what they're doing in many of these things. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Occasionally, they get the, they get the wrong automobiles in a in a photo in a film. They'll have a a um, they'll have one model of car in one scene and then a different model in another scene, which is supposedly the same car. Well, and you're you've been training for for decades to pick out those those little idiosyncrasies and inaccuracies in. So Any boy from south of the Mason Dixon line could tell a 57 Chevy from a 56 Ford. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, yes. <laughs> um, so tell me a little bit about your work on the, the Vegas history that, that you co-authored, because I, I find that that's super fascinating as, as well. I have an uncle who lived in Vegas for a long time, so that's we, particularly interesting. It was, it was one of the most interesting projects I ever worked on. We did a, uh, we decided to do for the centennial, well, for the millennium year, we decided to do a special project. And we did, since that, since Las Vegas was approximately 100 years old that year, we decided to do a uh, book on Las Vegas history. And we would do it by profiling the people who made the history happen. Uh, we would do 100 profiles of these different people. And uh, we saw nominations from the public and from people in, in the, uh, in the, that have been in the media and in public life. And we thought we would get maybe 50 nominations and have to come up with, uh, with 50 more names ourselves. We got over 300 nominations, and 
Uh, nearly all of them were people that you legitimately could have said made history. So we formed a committee of editors and uh, historians and people who had been in public life and argued over which ones to include literally in a smoke-filled room in a secret location because we were starting to get political pressure to include this person and that person. And uh, I think we made the right choices. It sounds like that the creation of the book in and of itself is, is a story. So. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that was difficult is that there are very, many very worthwhile people did not meet the criteria because of the nature of what they did, of what their contributions were. Like law enforcement doesn't change the city. Law enforcement keeps the city from going to hell in a handbasket. Uh, teachers don't change society usually. Teachers make sure that we, that the best of society is passed on to the next generation. Uh, that said, probably the most interesting person in the whole book was a teacher. Uh, she was a woman who uh, came west as a school marm because she got mad at the, the people in where she was teaching back east who said she couldn't wear a bicycle or go to go to an ice cream parlor, and. Uh, because it was unbecoming of a teacher, so she came west to a mining town, and uh, uh, she was a very starchy-looking woman. She looked like the, I, I, I think she looked like the uh, key figure in an old maid deck. <laughs> but she was a lively person who uh, would ride 17 miles on horseback to uh, to go to a dance and ride back and teach the next day. And she was, uh, she actually, they used to keep publicly keep speed records for for the, how fast people could go from one city to another. This was the four speed limits. And she held some of those records. Um, she would drive a, big Dodge touring car on her rounds and um, cook her own meals on a Dutch oven uh, at, a camp, at a campsite beside the road. She eventually helped found, um, helped found UNLV, the local college. Uh, Maud Frazier was her name. And if I had to sit down and have lunch with any of the people in the in in the uh, the first 100 book, that is who I would choose. She sounds like a, a fascinating person, for sure. I'd, I'd like to go have lunch with her, or ice cream. <laughs> yes. And some of the other people we had, like the first mayor, Pete Buell, uh, sold land that is now the most luxurious part of Las Vegas. He sold it for 150 an acre. And somebody asked his daughter what he would say if he found out he'd let that land go for $150 an acre. And uh, she said, he would say, I told you so. <laughs> he knew what he was doing. <laughs> yes. So do you have any plans um for a sequel to The Boys Who Woke Up Early, or what's your where, your next project? Where are you headed next? I did not have any plans, but people keep asking me to write one, so maybe I, so I'm looking into that possibility now. It took me so long to get this book published, though. I, I worked on this book and kept changing it and looking for a publisher. I spent over 30 years doing that. So if I... Uh, if it takes me as long to write a sequel, I'll only be 110 when I finish. <laughs> and I'm sure just as lively. <laughs> but people do ask me to write a sequel, and I'm, I'm seriously considering it right now. I think I probably will do it. There's so many aspects of that small town life that you can capture, even if you know you don't follow the same characters. Um, you can build on different aspects of, of that town, especially when you get to make it up a little bit because it's not 
based on a uh, on a real. Town. I do intend to follow the same characters, though, or at least one of them. Which uh, which character would you follow? Stony, the narrator. One thing I sh should mention is that uh, we also did an audio book with a nationally recognized voice actor named Christopher Carley. And oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was surprised how well he got the accents down. People in Western Virginia don't talk like people elsewhere. And uh, of course, we feel like we feel like we're the ones that have it right and everybody else is pronouncing Appalachia wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's that's true for a lot of local dialects. Um, being from New England, it's always like, oh, there's, you know, the, the Southern New England accent, there's the Maine accent, there's the New Hampshire accent. And uh, we all think we're, we're the right ones and <laughs> dropping half the consonants. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll definitely send people your way, and um, it's been fan fantastic talking with you and hearing about your amazing history, for sure. Well, thank well, thank you. Uh, it was it's it's been fun. Uh, most people will feel the book is very is a quick read, and they and it's and it's unpredictable and draws them right through. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, to checking it out myself for sure. I had a lot of fun doing. I had a lot of fun doing that. Well, I think that's uh, that's about all the time we have. But um, before we go, uh, where can people find your books and um, find find you online if they want to follow you? Well, they. Uh, uh, I'm going to be doing a book tour and or resuming a book tour soon in Virginia. Fantastic. In August, and. Uh, those events are all announced at uh, adhopkins.author at facebook.com. And there's also a list of information about the book at embereffects.com, I-M-B-R-I-F-E-X.com. Um, at, at the latter place, you can also get reviews, a sample chapter, and ordering information. All the reviews, by the way, have been great. Uh, People seem to like the characters, and they seem to feel the book has a has a uh, uh, has a feeling of reality to it. And uh, in fact, people in my hometown say uh, will often say, "Ad, you know, you didn't do that all that stuff." And I said, "Of course, I didn't do it. It's fiction. <laughs> it's a novel. That's the point." <laughs> so. Well, um, I'll definitely put the, uh, the links in the show notes for everyone who, who wants to check out your work. And um, we definitely are looking forward to the next book, even if it takes 30 years. Hopefully we'll all still be around then. <laughs> um, well, thank you. And uh, this has been the Amphibian Press Podcast. With me today was A.D. Hopkins, author of The Boys Who Woke Up Early. And I'm Sarah Porras. Thank you for listening. Thank you.